Welcome to the Celebrity Estates Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. For anyone new to the podcast in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and intent to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning stories, although often ridiculous in their details, generally have at their core very basic issues that can just as easily apply to non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. I'd like to welcome our guest this week, Paige Gepfer. Paige is a director at Anderson Global. She has over 15 years of experience in public accounting and specializes in individual, fiduciary, and estate income taxation. As a member of the private client services practice, she serves many ultra-high net worth families, develops and implements multi-generational wealth and estate plan transfers, and is responsible for the overall management of engagements by working directly with family office employees and multiple generations of family members. Welcome to the show, Paige. Thank you. Our subject this week is none other than the king himself, Elvis Aaron Presley. Elvis, for anyone who somehow doesn't know, was an American singer and actor. He's regarded as one of the most significant cultural icons of the 20th century. A rising past and impoverished upbringing, Elvis's success epitomized the American dream for many. The best-selling solo music artist of all time, he was commercially successful in numerous genres, including pop, country, R&B, adult contemporary, and gospel. He won three Grammy Awards, received the Lifetime Achievement Award at age 36 from the Grammys, and has been inducted into multiple music halls of fame. Presley also holds several records, the most RIAA certified gold and platinum albums, the most albums charted on the Billboard 200, and the most number one albums and number one singles on the UK album chart and UK singles charts, respectively. In 2018, Elvis was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. However, when Elvis died of a sudden heart attack in August 1977, his finances were a wreck. And yes, for the conspiracy nuts out there, we're going to continue under the assumption that Elvis is actually dead and not secretly living somewhere with a Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. Even though Elvis was the largest U.S. taxpayer in 1973 and had career earnings in the billions, that's with a B, he died with an estate worth only $10.2 million. And of that, over 70% went to pay estate taxes and fees. The blame here falls directly at the feet of Elvis's two main advisors. His father, Vernon, who was primarily in charge of his finances, even signed his checks, which is a, a somewhat surprising choice, given that Vernon himself spent a year in jail during Elvis's childhood for check forgery and had only an eighth grade education. And of course, his infamous manager, Colonel Tom Parker. Parker led Elvis into several ill-advised business deals. For instance, in 1973, they sold off Elvis's rights to future royalties from the songs he had recorded up to that date. So this is only four years before his death for a mere $5.4 million. So bad deals like this, as well as Vernon's inability to shield the king's earnings from tax liabilities, eventually wiped out Elvis's fortune. And Parker's story could fill its own episode, and he basically dedicated his life to fleecing the king. But the main number we'll highlight here is 50%, in that Parker received over 50% of Elvis's earnings, as per their management agreement, with 15-20% to being the general industry standard for that sort of thing. And he even convinced Vernon to pay him 50% of the income from Elvis's estate after Elvis died. Fortunately for his heirs, Elvis never sold off control of his hundreds of published songs, and they continued to generate revenue for him and for the estate after his death and today. Elvis Presley is one of the highest earning dead celebrities, according to Forbes, with his estate pulling at about $55 million a year. Now, when the subject of taxes comes up in reference to an estate plan, our thoughts often first jump to estate gift tax liabilities, naturally. However, income tax, both pre- and post-mortem, can play an even more important role for many estates. So, Paige, what are some of the ways that advisors and estate planners should take income tax planning and attributes into account? Thanks, David. You know, 
in doing this for 15 years, I've seen that the CPAs are really involved in all aspects of our clients' lives. And many times we serve as a quarterback for the advisory team. So, so when a client dies, we, we as CPAs and, and other advisors can be so valuable in terms of ensuring that various tax angles are reviewed. So we all know that there's been a large increase in the estate tax exemption in recent years. And, and really that's minimized the amount of estates that are taxable. So, um, so you might not think that there are issues that need to be thought about even for clients who are, you know, under the $11 million estate exemption, but, but numerous tax issues, income tax issues specifically still need to be addressed when a taxpayer dies. And, and one of those issues is dealing with carryovers that the taxpayer or the spouse of the taxpayer um, may have had at the time of his or her death. Now, unfortunately, I've seen that these carryovers or I'll refer to as income tax attributes sometimes tend to be the last thing considered by a client um, and sometimes the advisors as well. And by the time you realize there's a tax attribute remaining, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. It'll, the attribute we lost. Um, I found that practitioners might find significant income tax attributes are lost at death, including net operating losses, capital losses, and charitable deductions. Uh, fortunately, there is guidance, there's a revenue ruling that addresses how to handle um, some of these tax attributes at death. So, so we know what to do, or we know what happens to these tax attributes. And that revenue ruling addresses capital losses and that operating losses at death. And basically what it says is that, you know, the taxpayer who sustains the loss is entitled to take the deduction. And after that, those losses can't pass on to the estate. So it's a use it or lose it. And we as advisors, you know, CPA, attorney, investment advisors, we all need to be giving consideration to these potential loss deductions. Um, today, we're going to talk about a number of ways to plan. But really, the first way to start is that if, if anybody listening has clients who are older and married, take a look at their tax returns, take a look at their tax returns and look for these tax attributes that we're gonna discuss. And that will be a point of conversation that you can bring up to your clients on how to plan going forward. It really is important to include the CPA in, in these sorts of wealth planning teams. Um, you know, a lot of times you sort of, you know, the financial advisor is the one who's really sort of on the day to day is like personally the most involved with the client. Mm -hmm. But in terms of really knowing where the financial bodies are buried, uh, the CPA is the one who's going to know that information and have much more sort of idea about the behind the scenes of the person's finances and, and what you know uh, gymnastics can be done with them much more so than than most financial advisors will. Absolutely, you know, I've I've been surprised when maybe let's say the attorney is the the quarterback and maybe they're the ones who are working on the estate tax returns and and thankfully most attorneys that I work with if they are doing that that tax preparation, they usually involve us to do a review before things are finalized. But I'm always surprised when some mysterious asset, you know, that we know about as CPAs, because maybe we've been reporting something on the tax return, that the attorneys had no knowledge of whatsoever. Um, I always laugh when someone comes to me and says, you know, we need you to help us with our estate work. You know, it's very simple. That's usually what everybody says. It's very simple. There's nothing complicated about this. And I've never seen a simple estate, you know, even at a smaller wealth level. You know, there's always some, you know, African coins or, you know, <laughs> property in New Mexico or something that, you know, the family forgot about it was in a safety deposit box somewhere. So, yeah, you do. We all need to be working together. You know, and these things, it's not always as sinister as it sounds, right, with sort of the secret assets, um, especially when you're dealing with a sort of a more uh, old school, traditional sort of power dynamic where you have a husband and a wife or one, like one spouse, even if it's the wife is sort of the earner and the other is the sort of the caretaker. You have, sometimes there's assets that the earner has invested in that, and then he dies and the, the, the caretaker had no idea about these things. I mean, my friend's mother, to give an example found out only after his father died that he owned like a small part of several parking garages in New York. And he was an <laughs> oncologist. Like it was just not the sort of thing that you would ever just sort of know. And it was something that um, honestly, he maybe even a little bit forgot about. It was just something that probably showed up on his financial statements because it wasn't like a lot. 
But it was like, yeah. it's that sort of thing that the CPA will know about and be like, well, what about these? Where even the financial mm-hmm. advisor and the estate attorney might be looking at it and be like, well, what are you even talking about? Right, right. So one of the things that I, I see that, you know, CPAs can really lend a hand in terms of discovering those assets that might be unknown to the rest of the advisory team are, are net operating losses. So many of our clients you know, are entrepreneurs, they're business owners, and they might have, you know, losses that these net operating losses that, that die when the decedent dies. And, and that's can be a really unfortunate situation. Um, There is an exception to this. So for example, if a client has a net operating loss related to their business on their final income tax return, you can actually carry back that loss to earlier years. Thanks to the CARES Act, um, which amended the code, there's a, an allowance now you can carry back in a for calendar years 2018, 2019, and 2020. You can carry that back five years. Um, but if, if the decedent is filing a joint tax return, the other option is that that net operating loss can still be used by the surviving spouse if it's used by the year end of the year the decedent's um, the, the decedent died. The the kicker though is that um, the surviving spouse can't remarry before the end of the year. So maybe that's an incentive to to stay single. Um, but you know, one of the things that we should also be thinking about as advisors is you know if you have these net operating losses that are not attributed to the surviving spouse and are going to be lost after the final 1040 is filed, you know what what should we be doing? What should we be planning for? And I think my advice to those listening is that as practitioners, we have a pretty short window of planning opportunity for the surviving spouse to generate additional income for the remainder of the year after the decedent dies. And any income generated by the surviving spouse after the date of death, but before the end of the year can be used to offset the NOL. So maybe the surviving spouse should also be considering delaying deductions to the year after death. Um, Some examples that we might advise clients on is selling appreciated property. Maybe you want to take out um, your IRA um, amounts sooner than you would uh, or pension distributions. Uh, You might even want to do a Roth conversion, which I'll, I'll point out, you know, we have been doing a lot of calculations with our clients on Roth conversions lately with the market being the way it is. Um, maybe year to date IRA asset values are lower, you know, maybe your tax rates are going to be lower in 2020. So this might be an ideal year to do a Roth conversion. Um, I will also point out that if a taxpayer's death is imminent, so if we, we know this is going to happen, you, you actually might want to advise the taxpayer to withdraw their own IRA funds sooner to offset the NOL. And what's nice about that is that hopefully the IRA distribution will not be subject to tax because of the NOL, and it avoids the inherited IRA being taxed to the heirs at a higher rate. Um, However, as I mentioned, anything you don't use after the end of that year expires and can't be carried forward. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's all rumor at this point, obviously, but I think one of the, the testaments to the power of net operating losses to save you on taxes is the president, right? I think um, that, that some of his past things have shown that he's, he's still sort of been using the massive losses that he that he suffered, his businesses suffered in the, uh, in the, in the early 90s and late 80s. And he's been pulling forward tax and drawing tax deductions from those until today. Obviously, that's all rumor and hearsay. But if it's true, that sort of is a, an indicator of just how strong, you know, obviously, most clients are going to have it on the hundreds of millions of dollars scale like that. But it is to, that he can still be drawing forward possibly tax deductions from decades ago based on these losses mm. is, is pretty incredible. Yeah, I agree with you there. <laughs> there's a, a lot of unknown about what's going on with, with certain deductions that he might be carrying forward, but you know, a lot of, a lot of clients might have these losses. So it's, it's real money. It's re, it could have a real impact um, for, for someone who has died or their family. And it's really important also just, again, for people who, who aren't really in the, in the tax planning world, uh, a lot of times losses, you hear that, it's like, especially for financial advisors, so this, this is a dirty word, right? Losses in the portfolio, I'm not doing my, I'm not doing my job, I failed. Um, but really, these are all, for for clients, these, these are often opportunities, and you've only failed if you don't, in addition to incurring the loss, don't then take advantage of the, of the opportunity that the loss also provides. 
Absolutely. And speaking of investment advisors, you know, one of the things that we want to make sure we're, we're looking at are capital loss carry forwards. And this has kind of been a hot topic for us, um, specifically this year, uh, with, with everything that's been going on with the markets. And this is a little bit of a side tangent, but, you know, we have been exploring with our clients the ability to take um, a disaster loss um relief provisions related to security transactions. So something to think about, at least in terms of if your clients have been suffering substantial losses that are related to COVID, um, related specifically to, to securities, you know, there might be a way to, to get relief under the disaster loss provisions. But, but when you have someone who's dying and they have huge capital loss carry forwards, those go poof, they're gone. You know, those don't carry forward if they were generated solely by the decedent. Again, if you have a joint tax return and there's a surviving spouse, similar to not operating losses, the surviving spouse can offset the losses with gain before the end of the year. And then after the year of death, only the losses attributed to the surviving spouse continue. What I found is that you really have to be quite diligent as, a, as an advisor, a practitioner, a CPA, and make sure you're tracking whose losses are whose. You know, not all the property is likely to be joint property. I had a client die unexpectedly about 10 years ago, and it was quite the project going back and confirming whose losses were whose. And many times we were having to look at tax returns that we didn't prepare. And it's it's unfortunate to have to be dealing with those types of things, you know, and, and advising clients in such a, you know, emotionally sensitive time. But, um, you know, if you're aware that your client is failing in health, um, you should be looking for ways for the taxpayer or the surviving spouse to sell assets to generate capital gain to offset those carryovers. And I know, like you said, you know, a, a portfolio advisor might say, oh, you know, losses, deductions, bad you know, a lot of clients, they, I can't tell you the number of conversations I have when it's time to pay taxes. And I say, you know, you have these big tax bills because you have so much gain and they don't really like that either. <laughs> so, <laughs> but if you're going to lose a bunch of losses, you know, why not try to sell some assets to, to offset um, with a gain? One other thing to think about is that, you know, there's these rules, these wash sale rules where if you sell a security at a loss and you buy it back um, immediately within a certain time period, you know, the, the loss can't be attained. You know, if you sell the asset, if the surviving spouse sells the asset to generate gain, um, the wash sale, lose, wash sale rules don't apply when there's a gain. So the surviving spouse could immediately buy back the security they sold if they believe that investment was worthwhile to keep. Yeah, and that's, I think, a little bit hard to time because um, you're, you're dealing with sort of the very unexpected, okay, well, someone died and we don't know. If they, you can't, it's hard, you know, even though we're planning for these things, there are certain, you know, someone has died. Some, some of these losses and some of these events are un, unplannable effectively, right? You can't really time them correctly. But a lot of these losses, as yeah. you've mentioned, that are going to come from sales, these gains and losses, those very much can be timed. And yeah. it is important to keep that timing in mind. And that is something that can very much be planned for and, and sort of massaged and, oh, the tax rate is going to be higher this year. The next year, let's hold off on making this sale or let's take this loss now because this law specific law is going to go away and it's going to sunset and maybe we'll take advantage of things. So even though we're talking about death and taxes and, and sudden losses that maybe you feel like you can't be planned for, a lot of these gains and losses in particular can be planned for. Yeah. And, you know, going back to kind of just – you know, who's going to be the president and what laws are going to be in place with that. You know, we always see a lot of great planning that can be done when there's tax rate changes. And, you know, if Biden becomes the president, we're going to see a shift where at least he's he's proposing a shift in, you know, preferential rates for capital gains. And so there's definitely going to be a lot of planning we're going to be doing, you know, outside of death of taxpayer issues for our clients to make sure that we're taking advantage of, you know, when we realize certain transactions. But another example I wanted to point out too related to capital losses is let's say you have a client who has unrealized capital losses. Okay. And so that's where the fair market value of the asset is less than the cost basis. So if the decedent dies with the asset, what typically happens is the basis of the asset is adjusted to the data debt value. So in this unfortunate circumstance, um, the asset value would be what we would say step down from fair market value to, you know, a fair market value that's lower than basis. 
So it might be advisable to have a client harvest losses on those assets before death so that the unrealized loss doesn't disappear. Another option would be for the client to sell the property to a related party. The loss would be disallowed, but if the related party later sells that property property at a gain, the gain is recognized only to the extent it exceeds the loss. And this is the idea of of the the free quote unquote basis step up at death. Um, it's something we've talked about a lot on this show, and yet it's still extra important to stress here because it is, is in particular with income tax, one of the main sort of planning opportunities that you can sort of uh, hinge around, right? Where, you know, like you said, obviously taking an unrealized loss is like a catastrophe is a huge missed opportunity where you've just flat lost value for no gain. But, you know, in other situations, leaving, uh, you know, some highly depreciated asset in the estate, if you don't anticipate actually paying estate tax is pure profit, right? You're just right. all comes off the exemption and this is perfect. So there's a great deal of, of, and then you can reap income tax and further, you know, avoid further losses going forward on that asset just because you did this in the estate for the next person. So th- th- this is really the, the free basis step up is sort of a, um, the keystone a lot of times of, of, of this uh, estate and tax planning when, when the two things in, intermingle. Absolutely. Another thing that I've been seeing my clients um, talking about, especially is um, charitable giving. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, most of my clients who are uh, extremely charitable on the very edge of being extremely charitable, they really don't care if they're going to have charitable carryovers they will never use. Um, they're not giving to get the cha- tax deduction, they're giving to give. But This is a really interesting year for clients who are exceedingly charitable in terms of making donations because the CARES Act has honestly encouraged charitable giving. It provides for a 100% limit for cash donations uh, in 2020. And there are some specific nuances to this, but I'll leave it at that. But what this means is that clients have a really unique opportunity to give public charities money this year and zero out their income. So before this additional 100% threshold was enacted, there were only, and I say that sarcastically, there were only six different AGI limitations for how you could deduct a charitable donation. Cash donations previously were limited to 50% of your adjusted gross income, then it went to 60 and now it's 100 for this year. And I don't know if you're seeing this or hearing this too, but with, with prior disasters, you know, as with prior disasters, we're seeing an increase in giving. Um, Many people are giving to local and national organizations. So it's really a a unique year where clients are contemplating, you know, how should I be giving and how much should I be giving and and what does it mean for my taxes? Yeah, other people I've spoken to are seeing the same thing. I think it's testament to exactly what you're talking about, right? Is that Mm -hmm. the most charitable clients aren't in it for the tax deductions. They're giving now more than ever because people need it now more than ever. And then that's, that's their, their general motivation. The tax deduction aspect for most clients is gravy. Now, that doesn't mean you should ignore it and that you can be okay not taking advantage of it, but it's not their primary. You know, Even though uh, we look at a lot of it from our sort of lawyerly aspect of it, it's easy to look at it like, oh, you can give this and do this and all this. But really the reason they're giving is not that. It's, it's because of their own conscience and their, or their own passion or compassion. Yeah, I always tell my clients, you know, my clients that are going to be subject to estate taxes, your, you know, your assets are going to go three ways when you pass and you can decide now how that happens. Is it going to go to the government? Is it going to go to your family or is it going to go to charity? You decide in what proportions you want it to go. But if you do no planning, guess where it's going to go? It's going to go, you know, a significant portion of your assets are going to go to the government. It was actually funny. A previous guest actually has clients who, multiple clients who he explained that to, and they were just like, I'm completely okay with the government getting this money. I've got. <laughs> it's, a, it's an answer I've never heard, but it is funny that that person does exist, apparently. It was just like, oh, yeah, no, the, the government needs it. <laughs> oh, gosh, no, I've never heard a client say that. I actually um, have a client that I've been dealing with for quite a long time, and they are, um, they have a, a big family business, and I was with her over a period of days. And she, one morning after we had been talking about this exact topic, she said to me, I was dreaming about trust last night. And I said, yes, that's exactly what you need to be doing. <laughs> Dream about trusts. <laughs> but uh, the person clearly lives a, a vivid inner life. Yeah. 
All right. <laughs> but going back to charity, you know, if so, we do have clients. I, I've had clients die who have significant charitable contributions that are not not used on their final tax return. They're just lost. Um, and just like an NOL, if you're married and there's a surviving spouse, that surviving spouse can generate extra income before the end of the tax year and use that excess charitable contribution. Um, similar, similarly, the sur- surviving spouse could withdraw funds from the IRA or sell additional capital assets. And there are kind of some specific uh, rules about how to determine what gets carried over if there have been limitations. So I'll leave the listeners um, to go look at the regulations for that. But you know, our, a really good recommendation that we give to our clients. So let's say you have a client who has, who's charitable, they have considerable charitable carryovers, and they, they just really want to continue giving, but you're trying to figure out a way to help them actually get a deduction. What they should be doing is they should consider using trusts to make the charitable contributions because trusts, unlike individuals, do not have the, the limitations on their income that we have in terms of what we can take as a deduction. So, um, it's a really good planning opportunity. There are rules about what what a trust can deduct related to charitable contributions, but if you can create the specific type of trust that that contains those provisions, you know, it's a win. Interesting, interesting. And just to jump back uh, a couple of a point earlier, you used the term uh, zeroing out your income. Do you mind just really quickly clarifying for our, for maybe our listeners who don't know exactly what that means, what what that term means? <laughs> Yeah, basically, I mean, it's not an official term, but it's it's me basically saying that in this new CARES Act threshold that we have, you know, that you can, if you're giving to certain charities in 2020, that there is a um, an ability to uh, reduce your income, your taxable income um, to zero by how much you're giving in charitable contributions. Currently, you know, prior to care, the CARES Act, you were limited to 60% of your adjusted gross income was how much you could deduct for charitable contributions. But there's this provision right now where you can deduct up to 100% of your adjusted gross income um, pertaining to what you've given to charities. So it's it's a really, it's a great idea. I mean, I, you know, I personally don't have clients who are looking to give 100% of their income to charity, but if you have that type of client, you know, this is the year to do it. Yeah, and just to highlight, especially this year, that, that you know, a lot of the complaints about the previous tax act has been the elimination of all of these, you know, charitable deductions. And, and this is sort of a, a very special opportunity to, to sort of take old school advantage of them like you once would have maybe. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, speaking of kind of <laughs> the itemized deduction issue and clients now not not doing that, um, you know, a lot of my clients have significant investment interest expense carryovers, and some of those carryovers are related to um, deductions you take if you itemize your deductions. But just like NOLs, just like charitable contributions, if someone dies and they have investment interest expense carryovers, those are lost after um, the final tax return. And, And how those carryovers exist specifically is when a client's investment interest expense exceeds their net investment income. Um, there is an option to consider. And I've looked at this for a few of my clients who, who have not been dying, but it's just based on their fact pattern, where you can make an election to include preferentially taxed income. So for example, long-term capital gains in the computation of your net investment income. And maybe if you have a taxpayer that died and you want to make sure you're not losing those deductions, maybe it makes sense. Um, the, the rub though, is that you lose the favorable t- capital gains rates that exist for long-term capital gains if you make that election. Thankfully, I think most software providers that, that do tax return preparation, they can help you with the calculation. So it's not, it's not something you have to you know, get out your calculator for and do, run the numbers. You know, the software will, will run through the tax calculations for you. Have you been talking at all with your other speakers about interest rate planning? I mean, we are just every conversation with a client lately is, you know, interest rates are so low. No, honestly, it hasn't. We haven't really been talking about that topic at all. So if, if you care to, to, to expand yeah. that, that'd be great. Yeah. So, you know, interest rates are the lowest they've ever been. Um, the midterm AFR rate is 0.41%. The long-term AFR rate is 1.12% for August. And, you know, most clients, most wealthy clients have intrafamily loans. 
right? They're loaning money to, um, you know, maybe grandma is loaning money to grandchild to buy a house or something like that. Um, and there's the ability to use really low interest rates to do these, these lending situations. So if a client has um, investment interest expense carryover issues, maybe you should be considering, you know, especially if they're not in the best health, Maybe they should change their loans to be at a higher interest rate. I think right now we're telling our clients to refinance all of their loans, right, to get lock in these low rates. But maybe you actually want to do the opposite. Maybe you want to change your loans to be at a higher rate so that grandma is getting more interest income, which is going to offset these expenses that are she may eventually lose when she dies. So it's it's just there's a lot of angles you can look at it and now is just such a unique time, especially because of the, the current situation with tax rates and um, interest rates. Yeah, obviously, the interest rates also tie directly into the trusts question in that, you know, a number of different types of trusts are, are highly beneficial when interest rates are really, well, makes them much more powerful, I guess. Absolutely, right. Especially when you're doing, um, um, you know, grats or terrible trusts. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is related to foreign tax credit carryovers. And I, pretty much every client I work with, whether it's, you know, when I say lower income tax um, clients, you know, most of my clients are um, above $100 million in net worth. But I do have clients that are that are below um, 10, uh, $15 million of wealth. So someone who might not have significant investments in hedge funds or private equity, you know, even, even they have foreign tax credits that they're taking um, with their investment portfolios, but is it investment advisors? This is something that they should be thinking about and talking about their clients with, um, you know, if they have significant tax credits related to the foreign taxes, well, you know, I guess, what do you think happens to those when the taxpayer dies? Can you guess? <laughs> I honestly have no idea. They're lost. <laughs> so if it's it's just another example of if you don't use those when a taxpayer dies, you know, those credits are lost. But there is kind of an option that, that some people might not even be thinking about in that um, you can actually make an election. You can take the foreign taxes paid either as a deduction or a credit. Generally, it's completely more advantageous to take the credit versus the deduction because what a credit does is it is it reduces US income tax on a dollar per dollar basis, but a deduction just reduces the taxpayer's income subject to the tax. But as you mentioned before, with many taxpayers not itemizing their deductions anymore, which is where you would take the deduction for a foreign taxes, um, you might not get a benefit from from opting to do a deduction versus a credit. So the fact pattern that you should be looking for is if a taxpayer maybe has a net operating loss for the year, so they don't have any U.S. tax liability, and so therefore maybe a deduction would be better and it would just add to their NOL. And because of the new CARES Act, they could carry that NOL back. So it's it's a win. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time here, Paige. But I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot like I do with all my guests. And uh, you just you've mentioned the term fact pattern a couple of times. And we've talked about all these various tax attributes. So in your opinion, sort of, if you had to pick one that's the most common, and the most common fact pattern that, that advisors, you know, can take advantage of that maybe they're not in terms of tax attributes and income tax planning, you know, what would that be? I would say it's related to, um, to clients who have passive activity losses. I think most clients are passive investors in in many different types of investments and um, you really have to be um, vigilant in terms of making sure you're following the rules related to what happens to passive losses when a taxpayer dies. Um, you know, we've talked about step up, step down, but if a client dies with a $100,000 passive activity loss and there was an $80,000 step up in basis, you know, you can take the additional $20,000 as a passive activity loss deduction on the final 1040. So it's a great it's a great option. Um, most cases that I've seen, though, the step up greatly exceeds the passive activity losses. But I guess in closing, you know, something to think about is that if you have clients who have what's called a defective grantor trust, um, and that client has been reporting those passive losses on their income tax return, there are there is a position that you can take to. Um, free up 100% of the passive losses related to 
that defective grant or trust investment. And I think that's a real missed opportunity that um, if you're not really carefully reading through the law, you might think that, well, the client got a basis step up, so I can't use any of these losses. But the fact pattern is, is if you have a client with a defective grant or trust with passive activity losses related to investments in that trust, you need to really be scrutinizing, you know, can you take 100% of those losses? And the, the answer is yes. Well, I'd like to thank our guest, Paige Gepford, for being awesome and really taking us in a, in a comprehensive way through some actually fairly complicated stuff. Thanks for coming on, Paige. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. And for our listeners, I'll see you, or I guess you'll hear me on the next episode of Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous. Thank you for listening to the Celebrity Estates, Wills of the Rich and Famous podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.